Welcome to the Rose Cities, Rip City, Stumptown, and Bridgetown. Welcome to the Pride episode of Season 2 of My Real Portland, the podcast. I'm My Real Portland host, Joseph Lyons. I am so grateful you've tuned in, and you're about to meet four amazing Portland originals, a comedian, an activist, an elected official, and a musician. Each My Real Portland episode features amazing artists and performers from all around the city. I'll ask them each the Portland questionnaire, and then I'll throw in a game show on top of it all for a fun night out with friends, German food, and beer. Tonight's show was recorded live at Portland's Jade Lounge next to the Slide Inn at 24th and Southeast Ankeny on June 9th, 2019. Our next show is Sunday, July 14th at 6 p.m. Happy hours at 4.30. On that show, I'll have comedian Molly Smithson, author and raconteur R. Todd Kelly, and world musician Adam Carpinelli. A couple of show notes. For some reason, the second half of my interview with Karina Lucas got fried by my sound guy. And just as I'm getting ready to go find a new engineer in the last two months, I've started uh, volunteering with KBU Radio and made a new friend who's going to start running sound for My Real Portland. And um, so my crew is coming together and it's really fun and super cool. And that said, some of the sound is a little wonky and imperfect in this episode. So uh, that should be fixed by the next show. Speaking of wonky and imperfect, this show is produced by myself, Joseph Lyons, Portland realtor, helping home buyers and sellers make their real dreams become real estate. Putting this show together is my real dream. And I support this fun hobby with my professional day job in real estate. And my career is all word of mouth, so please tell others you know of my real Portland, the realtor, Joseph Lyons. That's josephlyons.com. And now, on with the show. It's always been home, I've always been here, I've always got time for one more beer. So pick up a beer, and pull up a chair, and strike up the band, it's my real Portland. Hello everybody, welcome to my real Portland! Let's begin tonight's episode like we do every night by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Chinook people, including the Multnomah and Clackamas. Coming to you live from the Verdant Jade Lounge at 23rd and Southeast Ankeny in my hometown, Portland, Oregon. This is My Real Portland, highlighting real people and real stories from all around the area. I'm your host, Joseph Lyons, a Portland original since 1974. And I have a great show lined up for you this evening, including musician Joaquin Lopez. Q Center Executive Director Cameron Witten, Gresham City Councilor Eddie Morales, and comedian Karina Lucas. Happy Pride, everybody. Okay, that is exactly how it looks online. It's like Happy Pride, and then everyone's complaining about everything about Pride. So, Happy Pride, everybody. Thank you. Oh, that feels better. Okay, so um, Portland is a weird place. I wound up becoming a realtor, a job that I had never expected to have. Uh, One of the first things that I did when I became a realtor five years ago is I put in a list of all the places that I had been in as a kid when I was growing up, like this year. First of all, I got to see uh, in the audience tonight, Udemine, my friend Udemine, um, we got to see her grandparents' house this spring. Um, which is just over at 16th and Market or something, yeah? 22nd and Market. And then I got to see my own grandmother's house that I spent like almost all my time in as a kid next door. And then just this afternoon, I went and saw my Aunt Peggy's house when I was a kid during the 80s. And while I was there, I wound up seeing my cousin Dana's babysitter. It is such a small world here in Portland. Um, So this show itself is weird. I mean, the whole reason why this show, My Real Portland, exists is because I met with a friend one night after a lot of social anxiety and and grief and whatnot and saying, I just, I don't know what's wrong with me. What do I need to do? And he says, Joe, you just need to get out and meet people. And so what I heard him say was, go out and start a podcast. And so really, this is just a cry for help that's gone way out of control. Thank you for laughing at that, Udemine. I know who my true friends are. Um, So my dream in Portland 
when I was 14 was to grow up and, and run my own theater in Portland. And I would have had no idea that it would manifest itself in hosting an, a locals only LGBTQ podcast. Now, if you had gone back in time and told 14 year old me, you'd be hosting a LGBTQ podcast. I would say, what the heck is a podcast? And then I'd say, what the heck is LGBTQ? And then I'd be really impressed that queer actually made it 30 years later. I'd be like, yeah, I was a member of Queer Nation in 1992. So actually that queer survived is a big thing. Um, so this, what's weird though, is that this isn't my first LGBTQ related podcast this weekend, my first one was actually yesterday morning between three and six with my co-host right here, Jason Rizzatello, on KBU 90.7 FM, Fearless Frequency, this fantastic time slot every other Saturday morning between three and six. You know, everyone is up listening to community radio every other Saturday. They schedule their lives around it. Um, so... Just to put a little bit of tonight and pride into context, I've got fantastic people on my show tonight who are all activists in their own right, um, whether that's their paid job or whether they do it through their arts. Um, it's, this is something that's been near and dear to my heart, and I wind up finding myself as the elder on the show. I'm older than everyone else in the show, which is totally bizarre to me. Um, and, I, and I felt it a little appropriate to take you all a little bit back in time to when I came out in 1991. amendment, which would forbid government promotion of homosexuality. Well, tonight, Michael Hanna wraps up his series, Private Lives, Public Issues, with a look at how the proposed amendment could change the way state government operates. Let's start with your entrance. Mr. Whiteside, I want to talk to you. I have stood all that I'm going to stand. High school drama student Joe Lyons rehearses for the fall school play. Like most high school seniors, he's eager to graduate and head off to college. Wrong, New York, New York, New York, New York. But Joe is different in one respect. He's openly gay. I guess I'm still kind of romantic. I, you know, if I want to go to the prom, it's going to be with, with, um... Look at that head of hair. <laughs> Wasn't that glorious? Yeah. So my companion, the person who I think I want to spend the rest of my life. As an admitted homosexual, Joe's life and the lives of other Oregon gays and lesbians could change if state voters approve a constitutional amendment labeling homosexuality as perverse. For Joe, that could forbid him from going to the prom with a boyfriend. It would also require Joe's teachers to tell students that homosexuality is wrong. The amendment forbids state promotion of homosexuality, raising questions about state policies. Very privileged to have a representative from Children's Service Division. Let's please welcome Glenda Page. Should a state CSD worker appear on a gay-oriented TV show to explain that CSD welcomes gay and lesbian foster parents? What about state-sanctioned adoptions by gay and lesbian parents, adoptions which are legal in Oregon? What about a gay teen support group meeting at a public library? Should Portland's police chief appear in uniform to endorse gay rights? Phoenix Rising. What about the State Licensed Counseling Center? Phoenix Rising works exclusively with gay and lesbian clients, telling them that homosexuality is a valued, acceptable way of life. Portland school counselors say they sometimes refer students to Phoenix Rising. Because we specifically lift in our articles of incorporation the words gay and lesbian, I don't think uh, we could necessarily exist. I don't think the state, I mean, that would be recognizing us, our existence. The amendment requires public schools and universities to teach students that homosexuality is wrong. So another way of calling that is heterosexism. That could regulate what Portland State Professor Johanna Brenner teaches her students in this women's studies class. It's not abnormal. It's not perverse. In public schools, the amendment could force teachers to change the way they handle AIDS education. You get a virus called HIV. For instance, Portland schools may be barred from allowing gay men with AIDS to talk to children. What about books and high school libraries? This Portland school offers titles like When Someone You Know Is Gay, 
and Understanding Sexual Identity, a book for gay teens. I think that those books are there and if the teenagers that are students uh, have a need to read them, want to read them, that they, they should be available. It's an unnatural, uh, uh, unhealthy uh, activity to get involved in. And it's something to be, we should discourage our children uh, from participating. Finally, the amendment forbids the state from granting minority status to homosexuals. That could limit the kind of language used by local governments to fight discrimination. For example, Portland Future Focus, a planning guide adopted by the Portland City Council, which calls for a media campaign to encourage cultural diversity, a campaign which would celebrate the contributions of all people, regardless of sexual orientation. The thing that we resist, you know, is the taking of this behavior and in any way, shape, or form, putting it into the protective status because that's promotion. We are saying this is wrong behavior. Wrong behavior or a legitimate minority group deserving protection from discrimination. That's a question which Oregon voters will likely consider when they vote next fall. In Portland, Michael Hanna, Channel 2 News. The OCA is now awaiting a ruling from the state Supreme Court on the final wording of its constitutional amendment. Once that ruling is made, the OCA hopes to collect enough signatures to qualify the ballot measure for next November's election. So what's great is we defeated the OCA. And then homophobia ended altogether. And now everything's fantastic. And please welcome to the stage my first guest who has recently been blowing it up with Dan Savage in Portland at Revolution Hall and in Denver. She's been featured at the Portland Queer and All Jane Comedy Festivals. Please welcome to the stage, Karina Lucas. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here. I was hanging out in front of a bar the other day and someone yelled at me, white trash, bitch. And you know what? It just felt good getting gendered properly, right? I felt so seen. Oh, my God. Have you all seen the movie The Silence of the Lambs? We all know that movie, huh? I fucking hate that movie. I just feel bad for Buffalo Bill the entire time. The poor girl goes through the ringer, all right? First of all, she gets this bullshit psychiatrist, Hannibal Lecter, who tells her she thinks she's a transsexual but isn't actually one. You know what? Fuck you, Hannibal Lecter. You may know how to cook a liver. You don't know shit about gender politics, all right? You know what the fuck you're talking about. I relate to the girl. I really do. Like, I'm not saying that I endorse skinning teenage girls to build a woman's suit but I get it, right? I mean, come on, the girl wants smooth skin. No biggie. Love being on hormones. They gave me these, these, these knockers here. I got these boobs here, which are, my boobs are like my miracle babies. You know what I mean? Because they came to me late in life, and if I'm being honest, they came out a little fucked up. Just a little bit, right? Just a teeny little bit. A lot of cool side effects of hormones that your orgasms change. I don't know if you know that. Like a testosterone orgasm, way more of a crotch-centered orgasm, whereas an estrogen orgasm is more of a fucking religious experience. Holy shit, it comes in waves, it's so strong. It's like touching a sexy electric fence. You know what I mean? It's incredible, I love it so much. Wanna have kids one day? I told someone that recently and they were like, oh, you're gonna adopt, right? Which I think is rude, you know what I mean? It would be like if I was in a wheelchair and I was like, hey, I'm gonna go to the store. And then you were like, oh, you're gonna roll there, huh? You're gonna roll there <laughs> in your wheelchair? I'm polyamorous too. I told my parents about that recently. I was so scared to tell them. I don't know why. They've been through so many of these talks before. Holy shit. <laughs> Fucking gay, bi, trans. At this point, I could walk up to them and be like, hey, just so you know, I'm getting a surgery to get my nipples converted into assholes. And they would just be like, yeah, that sounds like the kind of shit you do. I don't know. Just call us more. I think I've, I've been dating for a while. I think I figured out the secret to keep a relationship going. All you got to do is lie a bunch. You know what I mean? Just about like little things. Like I'll tell my partner I have six siblings when in reality I have chlamydia. You know what I mean? It's a nice, fun lie. It keeps everything going. People, you know, people assume that I'm kinky a lot, which I'm not. I'm a very vanilla person, okay? I don't even want to swallow. I don't want to do it. I'll do it, but here's the thing, everyone. Only if it's even, all right? So here's what we do. You come in my mouth, and then we split it. Yeah, exactly, right? I mama bird half of it back into your mouth. Come on, everyone. Feminist. <laughs> I fucking love straight boys. I have a weakness for them. I really do. Like, which gets me into trouble a lot. Like, you ever talk to a straight dude about anal? They're like a 12-year-old talking about drinking. You know what I mean? Because, like, they're intimidated, but they want to try it because they saw their dad doing it. You know what I mean? So they want to give it a whirl. Why not? 
I was on a date with this dude once. He was super fucking handsome, so I wanted to make a good impression. And I walk up to him. I'm ready to make a good impression. And I'm like, hi, my name is Karina. And he's like, hi, my name is Zach. And I'm like, oh, that used to be my name. Hey, what do you know? Isn't that cute, huh? Isn't that nice? I'm bi, though. I like girls, too. A lot of times when I hook up with girls, they'll tell me I'm the first girl they've ever had sex with. Like, I'm the lesbian starter kit or some shit like that. I don't know. Like, I get it. I come with my own strap-on, but I'm fucking... I'm better than that. My dick has features that no strap-on can ever have, right? There's not a strap-on in the world that will go soft when someone calls me daddy, right? That belongs to me. That's mine. I very much like this city. I like living, my favorite thing about this city, it's a city where being gay and being Christian have been reversed. You know what I mean? Like I had a friend tell me they were Christian the other day and I was just like, look dude, whatever you do in your own time, all right? No judgments. Fucking love this city. Here's the thing, I'm a bisexual, polyamorous trans woman and you know what that means? I'm the goddamn queen of Portland, that's what that means. Holy shit, people bow to me, you would not believe it. I pass people on the street and they take their glasses off and rub them to make sure they're seeing clearly. And then they put them back on and they're like, holy shit, Elijah Wood is transitioning. I had no idea. Good for him. No, 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 wait. Good for her. Am I right, everyone? Okay. That didn't hit as hard as I had hoped. Okay. <laughs> Let's do uh, another joke. Uh, I'm not supposed to drink on hormones. I'm really not supposed to drink on hormones, which is tricky for me because I am an alcoholic, baby. I drink for every... The other day... I had a drink to celebrate a healthy poop. That's not good, right? That's bad. All right, that'll do. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Stay up here. Stay up. Okay, I wasn't sure. I totally had no idea. I, know, I was I winging it. Okay. We actually have we actually have a sound cue that we need to play. Okay. Gold girls. Yeah. I'm a Blanche. I am such a Dorothy. You're a Dorothy? I was going to say you're a Dorothy. Yeah, yeah. Tonight, I'm going to be a Rose, though. You're going to be a Rose? Okay, oh, hit yeah. me with it. What kind of stories you got to tell me from middle of nowhere? <laughs> from from St. Olaf. St. Olaf. Thank you. Okay, good, good poll. Um, okay, so you are recording your first comedy special during the 2019 Portland Queer Comedy Festival. When, yes. where, how? Tell us all about okay. this. Okay, uh... Well, I just wanted to do it. <laughs> I wanted to record a half an hour really bad. And I ran a show at the time at Alberta Street Pub, and I was going to do it there. And then I was on a show with uh, Belinda Carroll, who runs the Portland Queer Comedy Festival. And I mentioned to her that I wanted to do that. And she offered to let me do a show at her festival, which was super cool because the audience is there hungry and great. And I love it. And right. it's a fun show. Yeah. The festivals here are so fantastic, especially yeah. what she and Dee and everyone else has done with that. Yeah, everyone's working on it. Um, Jenna, too, does a great job. Your show, you show up on video so well. There's a video of you in competition with another person. <laughs> I get really competitive. From Seattle. Yeah. You, you are a fighter when you come to stage as a comedian. Where does that come from? Uh, I have a bunch of brothers, uh, very football, <laughs> football jockish fans. Family, that explains and a lot. Uh, we fought for we fought all the time over everything and comp competitiveness was encouraged nurtured we were supposed to beat the crap out of each other you know what I mean it was <laughs> it was what I grew up in and it's hard to shake but so here I am <laughs> I'm ready to <laughs> cut some throats of people that I love I don't care who cares yeah. <laughs> have you ever done any roasts uh yes I have done some roasts I, I tend to lean a little too hard onto the mean side <laughs> I tend See? to get Pretty mean, because everyone's like, it's the re everyone's here to be mean, but I'm like, I'm, I don't know, Freud would have something to say about it. I'm you're, channeling. You're like that episode <laughs> where Dorothy goes just a little bit too far? Yeah, that's like every day in my life. I'm just going <laughs> a little bit too far. <laughs> now, you've gotten to work with fantastic people, including Dan Savage, uh -huh. a, a couple of times at least. Yeah. What's it like working with him? Uh, It's pretty cool. I mean, big theaters, which is always nice, you know right. what I mean? Yeah. I honestly, I hope you, I've never listened to his podcast before. I swear I've never, not on purpose. I just, it had never, I've never listened to a, I've never listened to a podcast in my life. I'm so sorry. No, I did not mean, that, no, no one knows who, a, what a podcast is. So no, it's because I'm old. I play video games all day, every day. It's the only thing I do. It's not a slight on podcasts at all. I'm trying to start one. I'm now, trying Dan, to start a podcast. I've never listened to one. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dan Savage was on TV. Do you know Dan Savage from like before, from like the 90s? Or you I remember when Santorum, the term Santorum became a thing. And I was super into that. 
And I knew him because of that. And I loved it. And I had a bit about Santorum and my dad came and saw it. And <laughs> it he went, came and saw it, did he? He didn't come to see the Santorum bit, but <laughs> <laughs> that would be weird if I was like, hey, dad, I got this great bit about the frothy mixture of anal, anal fecal matter and lubricant <laughs> that is often a byproduct of anal sex. And he's like, dope, awesome, sign me up. Forget <laughs> church, let's go to this. I think you are probably on the rising edge of your career in comedy. Do you, do you see it's that? It's been a good year or so. It's been a good, I mean, it'll, it's gonna downfall quick. I know it's coming, but for now it's been pretty good. Do you envision like what the sitcom future is or the, the Netflix oh, movie man, it's gotta be, version future of your life is? Yeah, I gotta be able to say dirty, mean things that's right that's, it's got to be that so it's not going to be I, don't, I think I have trouble I know you're supposed to like have like clean material or whatever to get farther but I can't do it <laughs> I can't I can't pull it off I'm just not I write it and I'm like this is boring garbage I hate it so much it doesn't sound like me at all you know right yeah yeah oh my god thank yeah. you one more time for Karina <laughs> Lucas <laughs> So my next guest came into my consciousness years ago when he led his own one-man hunger strike during Occupy Portland. He made news when he tweeted after three weeks, I hope I don't die. A run for mayor in seven years later, and he's very much alive and leading the Q Center through their phenomenal resilience campaign. I'm honored to welcome to My Real Portland, Cameron Witten. Mayor in 2012. Yes. I did. So, um, do you have any plans to announce for any future campaigns tonight on My Real Portland? That's that's cute. That's cute. Um, no, no comment. Oh you man! Didn't, like I would have asked my publicist first if I knew that question was coming. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> So it's really funny because like people all the time are like, oh my God, you ran for mayor and you were 20 years old. I don't think people understand that it's not that hard to lose an election. <laughs> all you need is to be a registered voter, get 100 signatures, and you're more than 93% likely, that's a real statistic, no it's not, to be a loser. Really? So, yeah. So it's not, it's, I'm not actually that oppressive. I'm a failed mayoral candidate and <laughs> anybody in this room could probably do it. You can too. <laughs> Thank you. Do you. But do you see an elected future for you? This is a hot C. What happened? I ran for uh, I know this twice, is not a comedian twice, up here. And I also ran for PCP, so technically three times. And now, okay, great. No, what? yeah, thank you. So, so nothing right now. Dodge. Uh, I'm like, let's talk about the weather. How's that weather? <laughs> the sun was out. Uh, Did it rain today? Oh, I, I like the sound of what I'm hearing, though. So, no, it's funny. Um, um, you know, I've been doing work in Portland for you know almost a decade now, mm -hmm. and it was weird to start that work running for mayor. And so, right. you know, at that time, uh, I was the most diverse person on the slate. You know, I was one of two people of color. I was one of three people under the age of 30. I was one of two LGBTQ identified candidates. I swear the other one had a crush on me. I don't blame him. <laughs> and it was interesting because, like, I would go to forums and I'd literally be Googling, like, policy 10 minutes earlier on my phone. You know, whatever. Like, you got to do the work. And right. so... Um, and it was funny because, you know, I probably would have voted for myself, TBH. I, wouldn't have, I wasn't going to vote for myself if I ha was, you know, this age back in 2012. I think the folks who didn't vote for me were very smart. Um, but one of the things that I talked about a lot was I represented a voice that wasn't at the table. And what was so profound about my race was that I would go to all these different candidate forums and they would just laugh at me, you know? It was, it was really ageist. They'd be like, oh, that's so cute. Oh, that's cute. Look at you running for office. And they would never give me a chance to speak. Mm -hmm. But the great thing was that I never stopped showing up. And my persistence, my dedication um, took notice. The, the top three noticed that I was coming around and many of them actually started donating their, donating their speaking time to me. Mm -hmm. 
during those forums. Wow. And that was transformative to me. It was a small thing, but you know, we live in a time in politics where it's just, you know, cutthroat and the, the, the crooked Hillary's and the crazy Bernie's, the name calling, the character assassinations. And it's not about the people. It's not about our future. And what I saw when I ran for mayor was that actually, in some ways, we put politics aside, we put personalities aside, and we actually try to support each other because we knew that the people of Portland would benefit. Mm -hmm. And so the folks who gave me time planted a seed, and it helped me realize that that's the work that I want to do. It doesn't matter if I'm in office or if I'm not, still not, answer, still not answering your question, <laughs> but I think for me a big lesson was uh, just the community. The community is what matters, and we mm -hmm. have to do what we can with what we have to fight for the community. Well, so even the Oregonian has recognized that you're a different kind of political figure, calling you one of the most intriguing political figures of our yes. time. So what, where, where do you, th what in your upbringing made you different? What, what made you think, okay, I'm going to go ahead and run for mayor at, at a young age where no one else is, and go ahead and say yes where other people weren't saying yes? That's a great question. Can I call you Joe? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for being a friend. Oh, so actually, I want to, before that non sequitur, one of my secret superpowers is that I have memorized over 161 TV show theme songs. <laughs> so when you started playing Golden Girls, and I didn't know that was happening, but yeah, something inside my heart just bounced. Oh, so. that's just 161? <laughs> now, is this an actual statistic? Can we test yes, this? Yes, you can test it. Okay. All right. We're Where's not going to do that now. We might do that later. <laughs> what was the question again? I don't even remember. Um, that that the the Oregonian recognizes you as one of the most uh, what made me unique? most intriguing yeah. political figures. What what about mm -hmm. you in your core makes you that yeah. different? I think we all have childhood stories, and you know I think that was a big part of my formative years. You know I was raised with uh, you know I had a sister, I had two brothers, I had a half sister. I like to joke that it took my parents five times to get it right. Apparently, I'm the only one in my family who actually likes that joke. <laughs> so I'm the youngest, in case anybody knows. I'm the youngest. Um, but I also grew up in a very dysfunctional home. I had a, a father who was abusive. He was abusive emotionally. He was physically. And I learned at a very young age that the only way that I thought I could live my life was to be silent. And it took a long time. It took even after I was 18 years old to realize that that was a lie. Mm -hmm. And so after I graduated from high school, about two months after graduation, I bought a Greyhound ticket. I was canvassing it out in Virginia in 90 degree, humid, muggy weather selling home insulation. And I said, I'm done with this. Oh so I said bye to my old boss, Randy, and bought a Greyhound ticket to Chanute, Kansas. I had no idea where I was going to go. Never heard of an Oregon before. I know how to say it right now. Oh, I, I, I heard some sisters here. Oh, yeah, you're one of those locals. <laughs> you know how to get to people <laughs> under their skin, right? Cue the music. <laughs> but um, So what that taught me especially coming out to Portland. And so when I came out to Portland, I was homeless. I was dropped off at the for, for, you know, doorstep of New Avenues for Youth and you know, surrounded by so many peers who might, at my age, all struggling to make ends meet, nearly half of these peers identifying as LGBTQ+, you know, exposed to mental health crises, substance addiction, domestic violence, human trafficking, all these things that I was never taught existed within the American dream. And it tied so much to my experience as a child. You know, my father, when I was 13 years old, had Child Protective Services called on him for the second time. I was like six or five when it first happened, so I didn't remember. Mm -hmm. And so at the age of 13, that's when I first realized, oh my God, I'm abused. I'm an abused child. And I thought that m during my entire childhood, nobody advocated for me. It made no sense to me. And then I started thinking about all the things that I lost all the opportunities I never got to do, the fear, the, the crying. Um, I was awful in school, even though I'm brilliant. Hello, I'm brilliant. And I was <laughs> right? awful at school. <laughs> and it wasn't because I didn't want to go to school. It's because I was like miserable on the inside. I didn't want to be good at anything. I didn't want to show off or be visible. I just wanted to hide and right. be small because I thought that's what was going to protect me. And I just realized because I had nobody advocating for me that I lost out on so much. Right. I came to Portland and I saw so many other people who did not have an advocate and so I decided to speak up and it led me to doing a lot of wild things like you know leading demonstrations for Occupy Portland running for mayor I did the hunger strike actually after I ran for mayor okay. um, but all these things that 
I, I didn't have a degree. I didn't have some you know, track record of civil rights mobilizations. I said I have a voice. And that's literally the thing that got me into the streets, that got me on the ballot, that got me on that hunger strike, is that all I had to do is tell myself I had a voice and I'm gonna use it. Bravo. That's fantastic. <laughs> what happened that brought you to Portland between Kansas and Portland? That, you glossed over that, I'm fascinated I'm saving about that, that for my memoir. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta pay me for those kind of questions. <laughs> okay, so at least... But I, it's a really wild story. You obviously left me hanging with something that's, that's, that's worth something, and I love that. <laughs> yes. I love that. I'm good at these podcasts. You know, I had a podcast, and like Karina, I've actually never listened to podcasts, but I had one for like a year. Yeah. Where at? Chocolate and Caramel. Really? Yeah, with Gregory McKelvey. How fun. Yeah, and then he moved away, so we kind of like canceled it. You could still do one remotely. He's in Atlanta now? Yeah. I know, that's so much work. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. And like when Joe invited me and there was like all this like you, PDF you know how phone calls work? Design. I know you're young. Do you know how phone calls I've work? I've heard of phone calls. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're just <laughs> as simple as that. Back in the 90s, OPB had a, had a podcast that was really just a, 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 pot, a, a phone call with four different women called Satellite Sisters. It was before podcasts ever existed. Everyone thought it was cutting edge. Um, okay. Uh, well, you know. So you so you could totally keep that going, and I think you should. When I came out in 1991, in my free time. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> when I came out in 1991, I prolonged. Uh, I belonged. I prolonged. Listen to that. I'm gonna have to cut that out. This is a podcast. I get to do that. <laughs> When I came out in 1991, I belonged to a gay youth group called Windfire. We were a part of Outside In and a Multnomah County Health Project. Um, uh, so I would have been one of Q Center's it, it, just perfect clientele. I would have walked through the doors mm -hmm. as a youth instead of to yeah. this other kind of place. How does it feel to have a place like the Q Center and that you now have the responsibility of running it? Oh, dang. Well, the first one, I love that question. The second one, not so much. Um, <laughs> Q Center is a you know, vital resource for this community. And uh, just like the community centers that first started popping up in the early 70s, we were formed to be a space uh, as, uh, as a home, to be a place for second chosen family. These are folks who, for generations, you know, LGBTQ folks have faced rejection from families, friends, places of employment, from society, rejection. And these community centers came up to be that place, to be that safe place for home, for family, uh, for life. Right. And so Q Center, even though we are a baby LGBTQ center compared to others, we were founded in 2003 and only got a permanent physical space in 2009, um, we still exist in homage and honor of that reality because the reality is that not much has changed. We have seen mm -hmm. some progress. We have seen marriage rights. We've seen equality acts being passed on statewide levels. Um, but there, we are seeing a rise in hate against our communities, both violently and societally. Um, our communities need safety now more than in a very long time. And so Q Center is doing the best that we can do to rise to the occasion. Back in February, you know, we heard about, from about a dozen different reported you know, incidences of assault against LGBTQ people in Portland, and that was just within a two week span. And we started getting calls from everybody, mayor's office, commissioners, the media, um, and we didn't have all of the answers. People kept, they came to us, as they've done many times during mm -hmm. the post-night sh post night, sh night shooting and all the other crises that happened in our community, people have come to Q Center. And we made space for them. We didn't have all the answers, but we knew that people needed to be safe and they needed space together to grieve, to process, and to move forward together. Right. And so um, we put together a really big town hall in less than a week. We had 600 people show up. What I loved about that, it was one of the most accessible events that I'd ever been to. We had ASL interpretation, we had therapists, we had free acupuncture, we had food, we had free childcare, we had free rides, we had safety patrolling the entire perimeter. And we also had a, an open town hall, uh, open mic at the mm -hmm. town hall and really got to hear from folks about what we can do better. And so um, with that, we've been able to 
expand the amount of free ride service that we pr provide so mm -hmm. people can come to and from Q Center for free for our programs. And we also have started, thanks to moving around some grant money, we've actually started offering self-defense classes. We're teaching Hapkido, and that's actually starting this Tuesday uh, as a pre-pride self-defense class. We'll be doing them for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. And so we are trying to uh, do what we can with our resources to ensure that our community is resilient. And we do know that even though hate is on the rise, that we can empower our community to fight back. My first self-defense class in town was in 1991 at a, uh, a community center over at 46th and, and Southeast Hawthorne. And I don't know that there's many people who recognize that, that it, when you grow up LGBT, that's one of the things that you have to do is go to self-defense classes. No one actually says that you're gonna be, that's part of the uh, plan when you come out. So, um, so you've got a huge uh, resilience campaign uh, going at Q Center to uh, make big improvements. Uh, your your full campaign is $100,000, mm -hmm. and how is, how is the uh, fundraiser going now? So, for a shameless plug, you can donate pdxqcenter.org slash resilience. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well. I'll say that again, don't worry, so you can write it down. Um, but, yeah. Q you Center. can also find out all the details at myrealportland.com. That too. Go to all the websites, please. <laughs> <laughs> so TBH, and this is actually part of the, your second question, which I deftly evaded. I love <laughs> evading questions. I am a politician. And uh, when I first started at Q Center, uh, what I lovingly call that organization is a dumpster fire phoenix. So not only are we a phoenix that ra rose from a fire, but we've really r risen from a dumpster fire. And so um, when I showed up, this was an organization that's been around for 10 years, and there's not been any improvements done to that facility. Yeah. And I do think that yeah. Q Center has faced a lot of you know, institutional challenges for funding, for support, because of homophobia and because of transphobia. And even though we have served over 20,000 visits per year, we have not had the resources that we need to ensure that that space that we have our 6,500 right. square foot facility is safe, welcoming, and vibrant. And so uh, thankfully we got some support from Prosser Portland with the city. Um, and then we raised, we had about 75% of funds ready before the beginning of June. And so for the month of June, we are trying to get to $100,000. Um, and so we're raising 25 right now. We've gotten support from corporate sponsors like White and Kennedy, Airbnb, and the Trailblazers. And we're really reaching out to our community because we want to see this as a grassroots effort. We really want to see the folks who are using the Q Center giving five, $10, giving back. Because I do believe that together, we are what makes this community possible. And so um, we've gotten about 25% of the way there. It's just been a week. So there's three weeks left of Pride. And I'm hoping that we can get that additional 75%. And, and so, you're going to be down at PDF, Pride and all yes. the big events. And we all have the shirts, we up. have decals, we have swags, we have house parties. We're going to be planning a canvas. There's a lot of ways that people can plug in. Let's take a look at you. Oh, no. Yeah, I know, right? No. I don't even know what video this is. This is so embarrassing. Do I have clothes on? Help to give light <laughs> to their aging facility. This is oh, the Q Center. Scratch the floors. Move it to lay on this light. <laughs> Okay, that was like about a good five seconds. Yeah, and look at all this fiberglass that's sticking up everywhere. That sounds With so excited. With the rising <laughs> crisis of anti-LGBTQ and hate crimes in Portland and beyond, uh, Q yeah, Center yeah, leaders believe the people who depend on their services deserve access to a space that's safe, welcoming, and vibrant. So they've made a goal to reach $100,000 to make critical upgrades. We've already raised $75,000 for our capital campaign. We need this additional $25,000 and we're really calling our community to come help us out in this time of need. This last push for fundraising will help them create a safe haven for LGBTQ people in Portland. For folks who are facing rejection in whatever way, we are here for them. We're providing a safe space, we are providing programs, we're providing visibility, advocacy, and empowerment. We do that through a diversity of ways because every single day our community's needs are different. But Q Center is doing that challenging work of trying to ensure that everybody has family. And by raising these funds, they say you're also raising up the future generation. In North Portland, Elise Haas, Coin6 News. I had clothes on, yes. Because <laughs> so, I don't know where you found some of those other pictures of me, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I am a stalker. You hired so, a PI. So how was it to have uh, local media out to the center? 
It was great. And, you know, uh, having done this work for a very long time, um, have just engaged with media in a lot of different ways. And, you know, I really do respect the fact that, you know, the media would take time and to share our story. And what was really great is that our story was shared accurately. And mm -hmm. that's not always the case, but I really appreciated nope. the fact that people got to see that nasty couch that I've been trying to throw out for a year. <laughs> <laughs> Please let us get new couches. Right? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so uh, we can stay in touch with the Q Center. How can people stay in touch with, with you and what's happening uh, with, with you in your life? Yeah, I have all the things. I have Scruff, I have Tinder, OK, keep it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I'm on the Twitters. I'm on, I'm not, I don't do Snapchat. So that's the one, like, I'm just not there yet. Like, I hit the, like, generational barrier. Mm -hmm. But, like, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Once Sweet. had a podcast. So get at me, at me. Fantastic. Me. Cameron Witten. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Stay resilient. Thank you for being a friend. Okay, so that sound means it's time for the My Real Portland Questionnaire. You need to stay here. Oh. You're not going anywhere. Oh, crap. Can we actually, like, play that whole song? We can. It's, it comes up later. Or Laverne and Shirley. Planned out. Can we do Laverne and Shirley? I don't have that one planned out. Uh, okay. What's your question? You'll have to come back. We'll, we'll plan your that Your questions make me feel so that. vulnerable. Uh, no, these ones are, are all going to be the same ones that you've heard of before. What's your I know, favorite? I'm not ready. What, well, that's okay. You're going you're gonna to answer this anyhow. What's your favorite smell in Portland? Uh, so, like, when I don't know the answer, I typically default to kombucha. And I really, yeah. <laughs> that's an it's odd not, answer It's for not that. dog fart or dog breath. It's not that. Okay, I like that. <laughs> you said it is. <laughs> Karina knows me. Uh, what's your favorite sound in Portland? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Can I phone a friend? <laughs> sure. What's my favorite sound? Like, I don't <laughs> even think, like, about... Uh. Okay, well then, well, that's okay. We'll skip that. We'll come okay. back to it. What's your favorite bridge? St. John's Bridge. Okay, easy peasy. So, so that one's Beautiful easy. bridge. Uh, what famous Portlandian would you most like to meet? You know, I've already met them again, but I'd like to re-meet them. I'd mm -hmm. probably pick Mitchell X S. Jackson, uh, because out of my many things that I do in my abundant free time is that I'm a writer and a novelist and it'd be great just to spend time with that dude because he's dope. I love thing. Now, I did not know that you were a novelist. That yes. is not a question that w I would have asked. Yeah. yeah. Instead, you asked him about bridge smells. Right. <laughs> so, so, okay. So, are you published? Have you published anything uh, No, yet? I'm not that good. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so, when, when you do publish, you'll let us know? I will. Okay. You'll invite me on the show, right? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, where is your most likely weekend breakfast? 3 a.m. Hot Cake House, 6 a.m. Stumptown Coffee, 10 a.m. right here at, for brunch at the Slide Inn, or somewhere for a Bloody Mary? I like just blending a smoothie at home. There you go. Yeah, some protein powder, some coconut, some peanut butter, a little bit of kale. I'm That's one of those Portlanders. Super healthy. I'm super healthy. I love that. I'm a vegan, I'm a sober vegan. Everybody's like, boo, get out. No, that's right. Fact, <laughs> but don't worry, I don't think I'm better than you. Like, I'm, yeah, a I, humble. I know. Um, if you could rename any Portland street, which street would you name and for whom? Oh, I feel like I, can it be a park? Because I think that's the one, okay. I'm mostly motivated because I want to rename Holiday Park. And I guess Holiday is also a street as well. And yeah. if anybody knows Ben Holiday, he was yeah, a big right, jerk. Like, I'm not, you're, yeah, you're, I got to be PC. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he wasn't even like good. He wasn't even good at being like a jerk. Like he failed miserably, like in flames in the end. Like, and why? Do, why are there so many things named after this dude who wasn't even good at being a jerk? So, who, who would you rename the park or the street for? Oh man, good question. Dang. So when I get questions like that, I default to Beyonce because I really don't have an answer. <laughs> so it's gonna be Beyonce Park. Why not? Or Kombucha Park. The Church of or the Park of Beyonce. <laughs> um, if you were a tree, which Portland area park would you like to be planted in? I'm gonna get revenge. So one of the things that has happened in my Portland journey is that I've been arrested five times, and my uh -huh. second arrest, third, third arrest, what happened to be in the world's smallest park. Oh, and really? Exactly, which is weird because it's a goddamn park. Right. I know, and they arrested me, and I was found guilty, and I had to pay three hundred dollars for standing now, in this park. Were you standing in the middle of it? I was standing in the middle. It was on video. Oh, yeah, I know. Exactly. Right. So if I had to be a tree, I'd be in that park, and nobody could arrest That's me. Right. Exactly. Oh, 
Stay put. Stand your ground. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that applause. <laughs> that's fantastic. I mean, I have so many questions about that. Now that's a piece of trivia that I love. <laughs> All right. Once again, Cameron Witten, everybody. Thank you for being a friend. Thank you. So my next guest is the founder of East County Rising. Um, I am indeed from East County myself, um, so his work is very near and dear to my heart. Um, he's also the newest city councilor of Gresham. Of Gresham! <laughs> Please welcome to the stage, City Councilor Eddie Morales. both mention you by name as, as someone who is doing phenomenal work in the city, in politics. Um, where, where did you come from? What, what, what's your origin story? Tell us, how, how are you in politics in Oregon in 2019? Yeah, well, those two are um, leaders that I really admire and look up to, and so I'm really honored that they would bring me up. Um, I'm so happy to be on your show, <laughs> and uh, we got to get you back to East County. <laughs> um, you know, uh, my partner and I moved back to Oregon after a 13-year career in D.C., and when we moved back, um, you know, we could have picked anywhere in, sort of in the world to live, actually, mm -hmm. and my partner was born and raised in Gresham, and I had just lost my mother, and I had a sister living in Gresham, and so we said, you know, we're gonna make Gresham our home. And um, after being there a year, um, we started to notice things, particularly after Trump was elected. Uh, I called my city council and I said, I really wish Gresham was a sanctuary city. Um, and I remember being rerouted to the sheriff's department and being told, uh, that's the sheriff's job to deal with those people. Uh, and I remember my librarian, um, just casually in conversation, telling me that she was living in her car, and she had been living in her car for three months. Uh, and I just thought that that was unbelievable that a county employee uh, was living in their car. And so I called my city council and I asked for uh, rent control and um, just heard nothing back. I started looking at the numbers and, you know, East County is one of the most diverse areas in Oregon, about 37% people of color. Um, one in five people in Gresham are living under poverty. It's a young city. And the people that were representing the city didn't really match that. The average age on the city <laughs> council was like city 62, uh, uh, all white mostly, mm -hmm. uh, mostly men. And uh, I said, well, we're not going to surrender this city that we love without a good fight. Mm -hmm. And so um, we got together with community and started talking about the need for representation and for people who live in the community to be uh, represented and for people who are making decisions about our livelihoods to look like us. And I try to recruit everyone to run because I never wanted to be a politician. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know, I'll raise money for you. I'll go door knocking for you. I will do everything for you. You just got to show up. And uh, no one took my call. And so what I realized is that this small town in East County was so entrenched by a small group of people that held power that anyone was a, that would run was afraid to run. Mm -hmm. Either their business would get hurt, they would be isolated by the community. And so I said, I have to be the first one mm. to run and I have to be the one that shows people that ordinary individuals can like run for office and win by being their authentic self. I did run as an openly gay Latino um, definitely the youngest on the council. And I have to remind people that the city of Gresham made national news uh, when it became the first city to discriminate against wedding cakes, right? So like, right. so people forget that, like just next door was the first place where like two lesbian women were trying to get married and someone said, we're not gonna make a cake for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so to run as an openly gay thing was a very conscientious thing. 
we have one of the uh, only like LGBT retirement uh, homes in Gresham. I didn't know that. What's it called? Um, and of course, I'm going to forget the name now. <laughs> yeah, Rainbow Vista. Rainbow there Vista. And I started going out and talking to our community and really believing that they were going to put me over the finish line uh, and that we were going to uh, have victories. And I got elected. Um, and we saw the largest turnout of young people, people of color. We beat Barack Obama turnout numbers in the little city of Gresham. Wow. <laughs> yeah. so. Um, so, I mean, I grew up, you know, I spent time in, in Gresham where actually where my first job was the same place where my mom showed for 4-H in the 50s. I sold shoes like professional Al Bundy at Troutman's Emporium at Gresham Town Fair. And so I've seen the city go through, and my family has seen, my Aunt Lucy lives in Gresham. Um, we've seen the city go through, <laughs> through a, a lot of transitions. Yeah. Did you, ex when you ran, did you expect that you would win? Did you expect that you would win with the percentage that you did and with the, um, did it turn out the way you thought it was gonna go? First of all, I love that you use the word percentage. I won by less than a percentage point. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah, I no. won. I won. Yeah, I won by fifty-eight votes. And however, however, it's still forty-nine percent, correct? Wasn't it? I mean, yeah, we we yeah. had a great turnout. Yes. So that's fantastic. Um, we, like I said, we broke turnout records in the city. Yeah. Um, no, we hadn't had this level again. Even when Barack Obama was on ticket, we didn't hit these numbers, which are the in our lifetime what people look to as great turnout. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because we went, you know, I, I knocked mobile homes, I knocked apartment complexes, I talked to everyone who had historically been ignored in elections, and I said, you have the most to gain and to lose in this election, mm -hmm. and um, your vote is your um, voice. I didn't think I was um, going to win. I, to be honest, I've run people for office who are members of Congress now, governors, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but it's different when you're in the seat and you're not the strategist and you sort of relinquish the strategy and the organizing to other people in the community. And that was such a humbling moment to like say my, uh, my whole self is in the hands of the voters and the people of Gresham. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna put myself out there as who I really am, like a first generation, single mom, poor high school dropout, you know, queer person and you're going to know what to do with me. And you're going to know if you're going to put your hopes in me. And it was like one of the most humbling things to, to like have won that support and to earn it. Um, I lost on election day, by the way. Uh, I lost by 1,500 votes. And I ran against the president of the city council. You know, I didn't pick an easy uh, election. Uh, <laughs> he had been there eight years. The Chamber of Commerce endorsed him, our local paper endorsed him. Um, they made me out to be the outsider, the Portlander coming in to Gresham, you know. Um, I, I remember I posted something about uh, National Coming Out Day and telling young people that it was going to be better. And I posed with my partner and our dog, uh, and I said, you know, uh, LGBT young people are three times more likely to commit suicide, right? And so to us, it was an important message to show people that, um, it gets better, and, and you know whether you choose to have a partner or not. Like, um, you will find a community that loves and supports you. I just remember getting tons of backlash from my opponent supporters about that being something that needed to remain in my bedroom. And to me, it was common sense and policy that like our job as leaders are to make the space for everyone to like live their full and free selves. Mm -hmm. um, so the next, so we had lost, I, I sat in bed the next day and drank tons of champagne. Uh, <laughs> my partner brought me breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks uh, to bed. And then, but I, but I kept, you know, refreshing. Like, there was something about me that really felt unsettled. I said, I had this hope in people, and people would come up to me in the streets and everywhere and just um, tell, tell me what I meant for them, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and so the next day, I was only down 500 votes. And then the next day, I was down 300 votes. And then like that week, I was up 26 votes. And then that was, they were done counting votes. And then in, in, in Montgomery County, they print off the list of all of the voters 
whose ballots are being challenged because they forgot to sign their ballot or their IDs didn't match. And I looked at that list and like over half of that were people that I remember talking to at their doors. Oh my gosh. And a lot of them were Latino surnames. And I said, those are my people. Those are the people that told me they're gonna vote for me. And so I called up all of our volunteers. I reassembled our campaign and we were given 10 days to go out and collect, help those people fix their ballots. And we went out and fixed it. Uh, we ended up getting um, 58 people who voted for me. Now, the one extra vote, and I go around and I tell everyone that they're my 59th voter. <laughs> <laughs> so when they, did the, when they did the recount, you know, they found one voter who had voted for my opponent, scratched out his name, and then voted for me. And so that's how I ended up with the Magic 59. Oh my and, gosh, that's fantastic. And, and it was the last election in Oregon to be called. It was called like November 28th. And, um, and you know, I, my, my dear friends are Stacey Abrams, who ran for governor in Georgia. Oh, yeah. And Andrew Gillum, who ran for governor in Florida. Sure. And David Garcia, who ran for governor in Arizona. And I was just cheering for them. And they were going into recounts and stuff. Yeah. And I felt so guilty when I won and they lost. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. How surreal. Yeah. What a lot of work, though, to, act, to need to go back and claim the position that you had won. Well, those are my people, and yeah. I didn't want their votes to not count because uh, I know what it meant to them. And I have this one story. His name was Maximilo, and he uh, is a blueberry farmer in Damascus, and he showed up on my list. And I knew that my friend had talked to Maximilo, so we called Maximilo, and we're like, Maximilo, your vote's not going to be counted because you forgot to sign it. And because you forgot to sign it, I have to drive you all the way down. And so Damascus is pretty far east. I have to drive you all the way down to the Monoma County office by MLK. And he's like, I've been in, I've, and this is the last day to do it. And I have to get you there by five o'clock. He's like, I finished working at four o'clock, but if you pick me up right here at the fields, I'll bring my, you know, have my ID and we'll go there together. So we picked him up, drove him down. He made it just in time. He started tearing up because he not only was voting for me, but he was voting to defeat this anti-immigrant initiative that was on the ballot. And we were the reason why he like voted. And so like that, like, those are the stories that I remember. So Maximil is definitely my 59. Oh my <laughs> God. So where is, the, where, where is your book? I want to read this book. What, what, I, I want to write a book about that entire week of, of, of losing and, and yeah. do you have plans for that at all? You know, my book's not going to be written until we have justice. You know, and that's my story. <laughs> and so uh, this is just like one part of that. Um, someone asked me, because right after the election, I started recruiting people to run for office. So I recruited 11 people to run for school boards in East County. 10 of them got elected. <laughs> 10 of them were people of color and young and queer. And we flipped five school boards, Mount Hood Community College, Gresham Barlow, Reynolds, Centennial, and David Douglas. And we got people that represented the students and the families that are going to those schools. So like Reynolds School District, 40% Latino in that school district. Now they have 40% Latinos on that school board making policy. That's what elections, and that's what politicians are supposed to look like. Exactly. And um, someone said, didn't your campaign end? What are you still out here doing knocking on doors? And I said, my campaign is not, <laughs> is not over. My campaign is one of justice. And when women have justice, when queer people have justice, when our elders have justice, when um, our young people have justice, like criminals have justice, like that's when I will feel like my work is done. Mm -hmm. But we're far from that. Right. <laughs> so um, you mentioned just now working, uh, you know, working with someone who works in the fields, Maximilio. Um, you've had um, some connections to, to people who have worked in the fields. In fact, um, in doing research for you, people have mentioned, hey, where did you find those, those um, photos? Oh, God. I found a, a video, <laughs> uh, uh, not of you, but of someone giving you a um, accolades. Oh. Um, now, everyone here is familiar with Cesar Chavez, Cesar Chavez Avenue at Boulevard. And um, of course, he did a lot of work with Dolores Huerta. Dolores Huerta is still with us. And um, she is one of the most important activists in our lifetime. And then 
Uh, so as I'm researching who are, who's gonna be my guests on my show, I go and find this. I want to congratulate Eddie Morales, my dear friend, on receiving the Innovators Award and thank the Midwest Academy for uh, bestowing this on him. Uh, you are such a wonderful person, Eddie. Uh, you do so much for the community and you have been out there in the forefront to understand and appreciate how and to work for participation of our community and civic engagement and uh, at the top echelons and yet you're down there at the grassroots level. Uh, you're a great person, Eddie, and I just want to thank you so much for being there, not only for representing our community, but to make sure that you reach out and you bring us uh, to the forefront of all of the important work that needs to be done. So, muchas gracias, Eddie, y si se puede. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, what was it? So this was actually following um, your sisters actually giving you accolades. And then Dolores Huerta, what was it like to actually be getting this award? Now this was four years ago at Midwest Academy. What was, what was that like? Yeah, you know, um, Dolores is my shiro. Right. Um, and another woman that's my shiro is a woman named Heather Booth. And Heather Booth, um, well everyone knows Dolores' story. And actually the very first political thing that I did was to lead a boycott for mushrooms uh, in solidarity with immigrant women at the University of Oregon. And we made our school stop buying pick sweet mushrooms. We made our grocery stores stop buying pick sweet mushrooms until these immigrant uh, farm worker women had a contract. Um, and so th that was full circle for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she, we're great friends now. Oh, that's um, so awesome. And I just feel so privileged to be able to access um, a living part of my history. You know, um, I've been organizing 20 years now and have no plans to ever stop organizing. I, I remember the moment that I committed to organizing and that my life would be given to that purpose. Yeah. Um, and so to have her and Heather Booth, so uh, Heather Booth, and I think it's really important to name her, um, around before, you know, Roe versus Wade and before abortions were legal in this country, Heather Booth started a network called the J Network and out of Chicago. And women could, would call this number and the J Network would connect you to an abortion provider. Um, and again, this was not legal. And most of those abortion providers were actually black doctors in the South. Mm. So just take that in for a moment. And uh, they would organize the whole things for you to get an abortion. Heather started the Midwest Academy and mm. was my mentor when I moved to DC. Oh, wow. And to have both of them kind of guiding me um, in my work is just like, I, could, I I'm, so, I'm so glad you found that video. <laughs> <laughs> and, and both of them are actually coming to Oregon to visit. Oh my gosh. Um, to Gresham too. Um, they just made a movie about um, Dolores and also about Heather Booth. And we're gonna be showing those in Gresham. And, okay. What and having this? them there. Um, I don't have the dates on me, but I will be posting these online. Fantastic, okay. Yeah. So speaking of on, online, where can people stay in touch with you? How can people follow you? Yeah, so I'm definitely on Twitter, and it's just Eddie Morales, E-D-D-Y-M-O-R-A-L-E-S, uh, Facebook and Instagram, and so. Fantastic. <laughs> sound means it's time for the My Real Portland questionnaire. So, Eddie, what is your favorite smell in Portland? Or you get for Gresham as well. You can include Thank Gresham. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it is my partner, Hugh. Aww. <laughs> and it's funny because a lot of people share that too. Like, they will go in for a hug and um, they're always like, oh my god, you smell amazing. And I was like, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite sound in Portland? And um, your answer cannot be Hugh to every answer. Oh, that, he, he is not my favorite sound. Uh, um, <laughs> I, you know, I love the rain. And then, my, uh, and then Hugh and I just went uh, to the Portland Opera on mm -hmm. Friday and watched the Barbara Seville on opening night. And I'm getting into opera, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but we have incredible local artists who are resident artists here with the opera and they have the most angelic voices, and um, one of them has a recital on the 24th, and people should go to that. Awesome. Yeah. 24th. 
what is your favorite bridge in Portland? I think the Broadway Bridge. Any reason? Uh, when I was younger, I, would, I was a runner. You wouldn't tell now. But I used to run back and forth okay. uh, on that bridge. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Uh, what famous Portlandian would you most like to meet? You know, um, I'm trying to think who I would want to meet. I feel like I've met a lot of, I think I've met everyone that I'd want to meet. I mean, that's actually something that happens with lots of our guests is that they've, they've, they're already so connected. Connected and they've already met all of yeah. the most famous. Yeah, you know, like Joanne Hardesty is a hero of mine, but her and I did organizing together almost 15 years ago, mm -hmm. right? And so, like, not only have we met, we've been in the trenches together. And so. Right? And actually, Mike Crenshaw, when I had him on, he, you know, of course, done t plenty of work, and he's like, yeah, I want to see Joanne again. Um, so, where are we most likely to find you for brunch? These days at home. At home. Yeah. yeah. Do you do the cooking or just you? We, we, it's actually one of the things that we love to do together. No one does that. And yeah. I love that. We love cooking together. And we'll go through phases where like, we will um, go all in on like French cuisine or Japanese cuisine and just do that for like months until we perfect recipes. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Very fun. <laughs> um, if you could rename any Portland or Gresham Street, which street would you rename and for who? Well, I think Dolores Huerta, obviously, right. deserves a street, and I think we should do that while we still have her in our presence, right. um, and so that she could see it. See, I'm, I'm voting for Darcel for the same reason, so that we can do it while there's still alive. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think I would do, um, I think I would do something in like Rockwood for her. Oh my gosh, that would be perfect. Yeah. Ruby Junction and would become um, could become Dolores Puerto Junction. Um, if you were a tree, which Portland area park would you like to be planted in? Or Gresham? Yeah, I was gonna say out in Monoma Falls. So oh, we have a, there you a go. we back into that at home, and yeah. um, there's something really humbling to look upon these this, these forests, right? And these are trees that have been there hundreds of years, and. Uh, it makes you feel pretty insignificant right. <laughs> and a reminder that we're here on borrowed time. And so, yeah. Well, here, thank you for sharing your time with us. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Gresham City Councilor Ed Morales. Thank you, Gresham. Thank you. Thank you for being a friend. Travel down the road and back again. Your heart is Tonight's questions are all about queer stuff in Portland. So when you think you know the answer to the questions I'm going to call out, you call out your name, and then we'll know that, that it's time to answer you. Now, each of you can have a, um, a lifeline in the audience, and we'll get to that if none of you, if neither of you know the answer to the question. So we're going to start off with a test question. Okay. It's going to be super easy. Stark Street was renamed for which San Francisco city supervisor? Joaquin. Joaquin. Right? I was supposed to do that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, um, was it Harvey Keitel? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Harvey Milk. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> oh Harvey Keitel is the actor. <laughs> Did you really do that? What? Did you go up on his name? Yeah. Because I, I do that all the time, right? <laughs> so that's what, that's what makes this game show fun. Okay. So, here we go. Here's your first question. So speaking, oh, that wasn't a question? No, that was just our test one. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> speaking of Harvey Milk, Gus Van Sant's 1989 breakout movie was filmed in Portland and was called what? Joaquin. Yes. My Own Private Idaho. That is incorrect. Really? That is, yeah, yeah. That's one of the 
Aaron, no? Uh, don't watch movies. <laughs> do you want a do you want a lifeline? Lifeline. Anyone in the audience yeah. think you know it? Uh, I want a lifeline, oh my Eddie. Gosh, this is hysterical, Eddie. Cameron. Yeah, Eddie? come on. You can do it. Hi, welcome. I'm, I'm gonna guess. Do you know it? You can I'll do say it. Paranoia Park. Oh. <laughs> this is crazy. What's the question again? Okay, speaking of Harvey Milk. Okay, so don't 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 worry about that. Don't worry about it. That's just Portland related. Gus Van Sant's 1989 break breakout movie was filmed in Portland and was called what? Elephant. No. Oh, that was newer. Okay, so so you can call for a lifeline from the audience. Somebody you think knows it? Yes. My Aunt Lucy doesn't know the answer to this question. It's drugstore cowboy. Oh, oh yeah. that's right. Okay. Every time people say these the questions are really hard, and I'm like, okay, I'll make them easier. Okay, that was question one. We're going downhill. Downhill. Okay, Joaquin and Aaron. This Seattle native is half responsible for the TV show Portlandia and half responsible for Sleater Kinney. Um, Aaron. Aaron. Uh, Carrie uh, Brownstein. Yes! Our first right question. I love it. Yay. Aaron is on the board with one point. Question number three. Dr. Alan Hart was one of Oregon's pioneer tra pioneering trans men whose surgeries were conducted at this Portland institution in 1917. A lot of affirming nods or, or questioning head shakes. The First Baptist Church on... <laughs> no. No? Oh, okay. No. <laughs> Any, anyone in the audience think you know it? Eddie? Eddie? Or we have another... Lifeline. Go ahead and use it. Lifeline. No. So it was actually... Eddie, do you think you know it? It was OHSU. Oh, now, actually, wow. at the time, it was the Oregon uh, University of Oregon uh, Medical. I have it here. Wow. Medical School it became OHSU after it merged with Willamette. Weird little bit of trivia that you now know. Hmm. Um, this Portland institution was taken to the U.S. Supreme Court over their refusal to grant benefits to same-sex partners because they weren't legally wed. This Portland institution, it might, oh. we may have been, we may have already answered this. No? No one? What? What is it again? This, or, this Portland institution was taken to U.S. Supreme Court over their refusal to grant benefits to same-sex partners because they weren't legally wed. No one? Lifeline? Cameron? Oregon Department of Justice? No. Oregon Human, uh, Oregon Health Sciences University, the same, <laughs> yeah, the same one as a wow. hundred years earlier, the same trans uh, 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 medical transplant one. So okay, the Portland Queer Comedy Festival launches next month. Which kids in the hall actor, famous for the character in My Spirit Animal, Buddy Cole, will be featured at the festival on my birthday, July seventeenth? Anyone know who Buddy Cole is? <laughs> no one knows who Buddy Cole is? What is happening? Uh, I am suddenly I am suddenly coming into 2019. This is crazy. Okay, the answer is Scott Thompson, and you all want to go <laughs> watch Scott Thompson at the Portland Queer Comedy Festival, June 17th. Okay, Portland is famous for drag performers from the Dark Cells, the former Embers. And this fabulous event at Portland's Washington Park. Ooh, Aaron. Aaron. Um, um, peacocks in the Park. That is correct. <laughs> Aaron, but peacock in the peacock Park is the correct. Park. You are, now, Aaron, when did you move to Portland? Um, seven years ago, February. Joaquin, how long have you lived here? Um, gosh, 37 years. Okay, yeah. <laughs> 30, 30 years and, and, and I'm impressed. I'm very impressed. 
The Portland chapter of which organization originating from San Francisco 30 years ago has leaders named Sister Debauchery and Sister Donna Van, Van Donna Van of a New Day? Joaquin. Joaquin. Um, Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. That is correct. Yay! <laughs> okay, so so that is it. Now you've all learned a little bit of something, and you've both won fabulous, fabulous swag prizes. Yay! Let me get them for you. They're right over here. <laughs> so you both get the Cooper Realty Big Mug, the My Real Portland Pint Glass, and... The Cooper Realty Keychain. <laughs> ah, there you are. Congratulations. Yay, you. you are the big winner. And you win the hey. follow the same exact thing. Congratulations. Awesome. Yay. Ladies and gentlemen, Joaquin and Aaron. Okay. So my final guest is my first returning guest. In the last year, this guy has completed his master in counseling and began his own counseling practice. Then he wrote and produced his own album, Universo, along with fully realized Kickstarter campaign with upcoming shows at the Milan Growth Theater. Please welcome back to My Real Portland, Joaquin Lopez. Okay, um, it's a pleasure to be here, everybody. My name is Joaquin Lopez. And uh, this song, I've never performed it live, and I've never performed it out in public. And so it's for your eyes for the first time. Let me get this court thing here. So I didn't actually write this song. I was dating somebody for a while. It was one on, on and off thing, and um, I struggled a lot with being vulnerable and letting go, right? So him and I just... Uh, didn't quite succeed there. And I took one of his um, poems that he wrote me and I put it into a song. And so this is a poem, um, not written by me, but by somebody that I de care deeply for. And I now dedicate it and share it to you and specifically to Eddie Morales because he is a fan and he's so dear. So this is to him too. I think that's all you need to know. And it's in Spanish, so if you don't understand what I'm saying, just feel it. And you can ask questions. Yo te extraño, yo te extraño. 
extraño el esfuerzo nos hace daño Pero aún te extraño yo, te extraño hoy Te quiero conmigo Pero no aguanto Un rechazo Que yo no fui el que te negaba. No puedo competir ante tu dolor. Al fin, para que el esfuerzo nos hace daño. Pero aún te extraño yo, te extraño El esfuerzo nos hace daño Pero aún te extraño yo, te extraño El esfuerzo nos hace daño Pero aún te extraño yo, te extraño El esfuerzo nos hace daño Pero aún te extraño yo Extraño hoy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to my real Portland. It's a pleasure to be back. Now this is a new single off of your new album, yes? Well, what I just performed for you, no, this, that was just a sneak peek. And uh, the first single from my first album is actually called Entrego, uh -huh. Surrender. So and this hasn't been released yet? No, it hasn't, just on your oh show. Oh my gosh. I know, I released on your show. I've been trying to find the rest of your album anywhere and it just doesn't exist. You are very good at keeping it secret. Yes, I'm really good at secrets. So, um, uh, you have mentioned this whole album is based off of music that you wanted to hear when you and I were both the same age going to the city nightclub here in Portland. And this is the music that, that you wanted to hear. How did that manifest? How did it come out? Yeah, um, great, great question. Um, so yes, I came out in 1989. I was 14 years old and I was in ninth grade. Um, and in Aloha, In Aloha, right? Right. yeah. And, you know, I only wish that, you know, Joe and I had been friends in that time because I think it would have been nice to have been friends with you and to have each other to have each other, right. you know? Um, but in that time, um, when you came out, and I was 14 at this time, um, I, the narrative in my head was like, I'm gonna die of AIDS, and everyone's gonna hate, or hate me, and I'm a disgrace to my family. So at 14 years old, you don't have much to work with, because developmentally, you're just 14. Um, and so what I did to connect and to feel like I belonged was I listened to electro pop music because mm -hmm. that was like the gayest thing I could find. <laughs> right? And, and for me, it was Erasure. Right? Yay! My, my co-host's yes. favorite band of I all time. I love Erasure. Yeah. So, and really when it was Erasure, when I found Erasure, um, it was this you know, person's voice that was so feminine and masculine at the, same, at the same time and so unapologetic about their expression. And for me, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, like that's crazy. And so I really, I really just connected to that. And mm -hmm. then there's also like New Order and Depeche Mode and George right. Michael. And, right. Uh, and of course, Madonna and uh, Pet Shop Boys. So. I, and I, so that was my time, I was 14 years old, and so what I used to do, and I'm sure you did this too, was like, I would pay, I think it was 85 cents or 75 cents, and we got on the bus, 
bus 52 Farmington, <laughs> bus 52 Farmington something. And then uh, my girlfriends and I, we would arrive downtown Portland and spend all day downtown Portland smoking cigarettes because we were so cool and <laughs> drinking coffee, you know? And so then we would wait for nine o'clock to come around because then we would go to the city nightclub mm-hmm. and we would dance at the city <laughs> nightclub. And it was the underage nightclub that you could go to. And as well as Quest. And the, the, what was so cool about the City Nightclub, and it's legendary, the, the, the dance floor would light up. And I remember the first time I went, I went with a friend of mine. We, we like, we, I think I told my mom I was doing one thing and I was doing this. Oh, and I think that's absolutely. how you do it, for right? Two, oh yeah, for two years, mom thought I was going and studying at the library and wondering why I was coming home at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Because you wanted to be smart. Yeah, exactly, right? I'm studying, Mom. <laughs> so um, I remember the first time I went to the City Nightclub, and I remember exactly what I was wearing. And taking that first step like onto the dance floor, it's like I can be who I am, you know? And it doesn't matter what I am. Mm-hmm. And everyone is, is just putting their best out there. And I remember this this time, it was like Madonna's Vogue came out, oh, yeah. which was all about claiming your space and just fucking, you know, being 100% real. And it was such, like, it was so cultural. Like, you'd be, you'd be on the dance floor and then, like, you'd hear, like, the violins of Madonna come on. And here I was, like, this 14, 15-year-old kid and drag queens and drug addicts and, you know, people, um, adults, all, all, like, taking a moment and just, like, embracing that Madonna's Vogue sound and thing. And it was, like, so powerful. Mm -hmm. And... As I got older, as you, we all do, I, <laughs> I needed some of that power. Yeah. So um, what I did is I, I compartmentalized myself so well. You know, um, so I really just shoved the, uh, that more feminine and that more vulnerable Joaquin, you right. know? Right. And, uh, and, and I just realized, like when I was 40, 41, that it was time to reclaim that aspect of myself because I miss it. Mm-hmm. And I miss him. <laughs> so, um, and I know that I'm not alone. Right. Because there's like you and there's everyone else here. And it's not even about being gay. Mm-hmm. It's just about fucking being human yeah. and coming out. You and know? being your full self. And being your full yeah. self. So I wanted to honor that, and um, so I embarked on creating this album called Universo, and what I wanted to do is I wanted to use the sounds and the rhythms and the feels of that 80s, 90s dance floor, electro-pop dance Mm -hmm. floor, right? And I wanted to create an album that just expressed who I was, and I wanted to create an album that that 14-year-old boy had wanted all his life, you know? So that's what I did, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm here. <laughs> well, so in context of this, so, so Joaquin's first um, single, uh, Entrego, has just come out. We're going to hear that in just a little bit, right? So I get my first radio show on KBOO yesterday morning, and at um, 5.30, I played a little bit of our interview from our last show and played it and played in Trago. And then the next half hour goes by and I'm, I have a few minutes left to play at the, at the end of my show. So I'm like, I'll just go ahead and put Joaquin's and Trago on once more. The new DJ has just showed up and I'm leaving. It's now 6 a.m. Our show is 3 to 6 a.m. on Saturday morning. Uh, like as you're all up from 3 to 6 a.m. on Saturday, right? It is streaming at kboo.fm. You can find it there. Um, so anyhow, it was your song on the air as I'm leaving the station and, and your voice just kind of fades out into nothing from, you know, it's playing down the studio hall and all that kind of stuff out, out of Kboo, just right down the street at, at, on 8th Street. And then I get into my car, Jason and I get into my car and I turn on 
the radio and you're still singing just right there where I had left off in my head. And it was the most amazing feeling. I thought, wow, here I am, you know, this, you know, who I, this little kid that grew up here, I would have never expected to have this experience. Well, I had just seen a, the the last end of Pump Up the Volume, which is about owning owning your voice and yeah. taking back the airwaves. And yeah. I felt so empowered and I did it with your voice. Oh, you. So um, with 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 all of that wonderfulness said and all of that that good stuff, you um, just on Thursday performed with in front of the Multnomah County Commissioners in um, the dedication of Pride and the 50th anniversary of Stonewall. What was that like? Oh, that was really amazing. Um, yeah, the Multnomah County Pride Proclamation, uh, we were the invited guests, uh, myself and my friend Chicana, um, as, a, as known as Michael Cavazos, my friend. Uh-huh. Um, <clears throat> So Michael Cavazos is actually the co-creator of the um, theatrical show Universo. So I asked Michael to join me for the proclamation. And it was amazing to be there because um, Portland has a really deep history of um, fighters in this Cult, in this society, in yeah. this community, uh, truly lady, laying down the foundations um, who are about a, a generation or two older than me. And so what I loved uh, was hearing their story and I loved how they're still living Mm-hmm. And I love how I was able to um, bring joy to that event and that proclamation. And I really love that we were able to celebrate um, that root that sparked this whole thing at Stonewall with uh, Sylvia, I forget her last name, uh, who really sparked the revolution. And it was so cool to be a part of that. So it was a real mm-hmm. honor to be there at the Multnomah County board session, which is so dry and boring. <laughs> and even they would say that. And when I came on, I made them all dance and get up and, and shake their booty. So it was a lot of fun. That is awesome. Yeah. Um, so tell us about your, um, your performances coming up at Milagro. Oh, yes. So... Um, I'm collaborating with Hand to Mouth Theater. They uh, specialize in devised work. They've been around for almost 20 years. And um, they're helping me co-present this production of Universo. And Universo is going to be a, I'm calling it an electro-pop theatrical concert. So it's going to be on a set. It's going to feel like a planetarium. There is a soundscape from beginning to end that interweaves all the songs on the album. And there is an overarching mythic story of a person working through their darkness to find the light. And it incorporates sound, music, language, both in Spanish and English, and um, did I say projection? No. Projection and projection. Um, I'm having a grand time um, producing it. It is taking every fiber of my being, mm-hmm. and I'm learning a lot about myself. And I used to think I was not this, but I realized I am a very big control freak. I like, I like to control everything. I like to control how I sound, how I look, and how I'm taken in mm-hmm. by other people. It's, I, just, I never thought of that, but I am. And isn't it fun to be learning new things about your, your, yourself? <laughs> things that you would never expect while you're trying to actually create art and be meaningful. And you're like, oh, great, this, this wonderful human part of myself. But I do have to say this, and yeah. this goes, uh, this goes un, un, um, uncelebrated or unmentioned. The team that one puts yourself around, um, I have a, I'm very fortunate that I have a very flexible, understanding uh, team, resilient team that allows me to make a full-on decision and say, yeah, we're going this way and then say the next day, you know what, I don't think I want to do that after we spend time committed to that. Mm-hmm. And so I really appreciate uh, my team's flexibility and ability to just say, okay, well, Keen's change is mine, and let's just move, continue moving forward. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so where can, uh, where can people follow you? How can they stay in touch with you and find out about when your show is and all that? As soon as I walk out this door, people can follow me. <laughs> To maybe Matador or um, the movie theater? 
<laughs> you no, can find right. me, you right. can find me online walkinglopezmusic.com I'm on Facebook as well I don't do Twitter um, and I don't do Snapchat either yeah. um, and I'm not I am not on Grinder I'm not on Tinder <laughs> I'm not on the I'll, I'll scruff on any of that it's a, I'm like the only gay man that's not on that <laughs> it, you should it's amazing what you find out about your fellow uh, your fellow neighbors that way um, okay. Thank you for being a friend. Okay, that sound means it's time for our final My Real Portland questionnaire. Joaquin, are you ready? Yeah, I am. What is your favorite smell in Portland? Okay, I have two answers. Mm-hmm. One that is going to be for the show, and one's going to be, uh, you can edit it. Okay, okay. All right. Um, my favorite smell is um, in the mornings when I drive by that Franz Bakery. Oh, right. Yeah, it it's smells the best. fucking good. Yeah. It's really good. Um, and we'll cut that one out. No, now your other answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this, this buddy over here, Eddie Morales, <laughs> he smells really good. <laughs> When, when, I, when, I, when I said hi to him this morning or today, I was like, you smell really good. It's like, wow, you smell really good. I, I'll say that your answer was so funny because I was going to say, actually, Eddie, you smell really good right? when you said that. But um, So what's your favorite sound in Portland? My favorite sound is, um, you know, this is going to sound funny. I, I love the sound of a cash register opening <laughs> <laughs> because that means the business is is going and um, I grew up in a small business and so like you always sure. you always want to hear that cash register drawer open you know um, that's my favorite sound but you know that may not exist anymore because of the whole like I, Apple pay and all that kind of stuff uh-huh. they've got they've got to create a sound for I, that I mean it sounds like almost an anachronism the cash register I mean do we have those anymore yeah I don't think we have a cash register um, we have a cash app there you there you go um, how does your what's your favorite bridge in Portland I think the Hawthorne Bridge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like the Hawthorne Bridge. There was um, in 2001. I used to work at this bar called Boogie Woogies, and it was a, a piano bar. <laughs> and I was. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and it was owned by the people that own Stars Cabaret, and um, I was the only guy waiter there. Oh my god. And gosh. Um, I would make if the girls made like 300 bucks that day. A night, I would make maybe one fifty or one hundred dollars, right? Because that's just the way it was. But I lived on Twelfth and Hawthorne mm. in that Mulberry Apartments, like their blue apartments there. Mm-hmm. And I had a studio there, and so I would like get up in the morning, or whenever I'd get up and go running, and I'd run across the Hawthorne Bridge, and I would walk across the Hawthorne Bridge to go to work um, when I worked at Boogie Woogies. And it was a really cool time, because it was like the first time I was paying for my own rent. I was uh, being kind of solitary and an, and an adult. I think I was 26, maybe. And um, so I would say the Hawthorne Bridge, because it carries a lot of history for me. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Uh, where are we most likely to find you for a weekend brunch? I hate brunch. I really <laughs> do. Um, it's the most Portland thing I out know. there. I really struggle with waiting in line. Um, mm-hmm. No lines here ever at 11 a.m. at the slide in. <laughs> <laughs> I really struggle with waiting in lines. Um, so I don't go to brunch. I think, uh, you know, I have been here. I like it here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't go to brunch. <laughs> what, what Portlandian would you most like to meet? You know who I think I'd like to meet um, is uh, Gus Van Sant. Mm. Yeah, I think I'd like to meet him. He seems really interesting. Creative genius. Kind of creative right? and yeah. interesting. If you could rename any Portland street, which street and for who? Um, you know, I, I heard you ask everybody and I never thought, I haven't thought about it, but, um, I think that, um, what would I rename? Don't know. That's all right. Yeah. I don't know what I would rename. Oh, you know what I would rename is Gleason mm-hmm. because it's like 
spelled glisten, right? And you spell gli- or it sounds glisten. I don't know. I would like to clarify that street. Just, just, <laughs> just because no one. Yeah, everyone wants to say it's yeah, the other it's thing. Glisten, and it's glisten, but it's not. glisten. But I like glisten. It's kind of nice, right? We should just call it glisten and rename glisten. it that way. Um, if you were a tree, which Portland area park would you like to be planted in? I think I would like to be planted at the waterfront. That would be cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like the waterfront. There's a lot of people, and you're never really alone, and you're also alongside those cherry trees that blossom so beautifully, and then you have the river, and I think that would be a nice place to, like... sailors come around for a week once a... And and piss on your bark and shit. (laughs) Right. That's, like, you know, that's good, and that's cool. Cool. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, Joaquin Lopez. This song is totally inspired by Erasure and Pet Shop Boys and that whole era. And it's about just kind of uh, believing in others again and believing in yourself again. And if you want to dance, you can sure dance. So blondie. One of those like 70s shows, you know, the person is just here, you know. Look kind of awkward. Déjame decirte que todo cambiará, amor. Todo cambiará, mi amor. Estaría y hasta el final No te dejaré amor No te dejaré mi amor Eres tú el viento y yo El árbol meciéndose El árbol meciéndose Ella es kind y 
me entrego Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Joaquin Lopez. Please give it up for all my guests, Teddy Morales, Cameron Whitten, and Corina Lucas. You've been a fantastic, my real Portland audience. Uh, come back and see us in a month. Good night, everybody. It's always been home, I've always been here, I've always got time for one more beer. So pick up a beer and pull up a chair and strike up the band, it's my real point.